This is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder, uh, with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. And I'm interviewing James Paul Noel for the Shalako interview series. Um, James, you are a Shalako graduate of 65. You served in the Shalako Army National Guard. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your um, experiences at Shalako, your service, and uh, some of the things you did after you got out. Okay. Um, thank you for talking with me today. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Mom, Oklahoma, and that's where I grew up. Uh, what was Miami like back then? Well, Miami back then is kind of like, uh, probably like any other small town. It's not what. Uh, Probably 14,000, something like that. Uh -huh. And uh, as I grew up, uh, we, there wasn't any sports for us because they didn't have little league and stuff back then. So, but then when they, you know, they had Babe Ruth, I started in that. And you liked baseball? About the only thing there was. <laughs> I was 14 years old when I started. So. Oh, okay. And then before that, I, that's when I came to Shalako when okay. I was 14. What did your folks do for a living? Uh, my dad, he was a, a roofer. My mother, she worked in a sewing factory. And what was your relationship, uh, your Cherokee and Choctaw, mm -hmm. what was your relationship with your grandparents on either side? On either side? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. I mean, they were, matter of fact, uh, my grandmother and my grandfather, they both were, well, mixed. One was Cherokee, one was Choctaw, kind of like it's I got that. But they uh, they were great. I mean, the old-fashioned type stuff, you know. And then just like my great granddad, we they didn't allow us to uh, speak Indian. Mm -hmm. They did. Mm -hmm. They taught us a little bit because your great grandfather. Yes, and well, my uh, aunt and uncles too. They would teach us a little bit, but they wouldn't want us to because. I don't know how to say this. It wasn't right to, or wasn't accepted, put it that way. And the uh, since it's on tape, I don't know how to say it. Uh, Caucasian, maybe mm -hmm. world, mm -hmm. and uh, because you know they they made fun of you, put that way. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I came to Shalako too, is I got in so much trouble because of the color of my skin. Yeah, I was wondering about your public school experiences in Miami. Fighting, <laughs> I fought. I mean, I fought probably every day, most likely, mm. over mm -hmm. that type of thing. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, didn't understand it, but, I mean, I don't know. It's on tape, I mean, I, I, I used to send my kids down and told, me about, told them about it, so. Right. And they want to know why I went here as well. I, I, basically, I didn't have a choice. Is either beat every, try to get beat up every day, or and I found out about Chilaco. Uh My dad's telling me about it. So there's a place there, and so I found out about it. And I said, "Well, I got to make a decision. Am I going to end up in jail, or am I going to?" Mm -hmm. So I made that decision to come to Chilaco. And you were in, you were 14 then, yeah. you were in middle school, yeah, junior high. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, when I got here, of course, you know, the, I don't know how to explain it, Native American has got a, a gene in them where, I guess you call it, they're, they're quiet or something, you know, they, they watch and instead of cracking at the first pop, they stand back and watch and, and then going in well basically what it does and uh, met every some of the kids here and uh, uh, we went out on campus and stuff like that and I didn't even go home after that I didn't want to go home I felt in I guess you people say I don't know if I fell in love with this place but I got treated right I mean I you know I wasn't called names anymore mm -hmm. and uh, I could walk outside without knowing I'm not going to have a fight today and uh, what I got in sports and everything like that. So, and uh, where did you um, your your home your dorm was? My dorm was uh, I believe it was home. 
five, I believe. Home five. And uh, then, then the home six, which is uh, home. The other, that one, other one burnt down or they tore it down. Mm -hmm. But home six is still there. Mm -hmm. All the dorms were like, like home six and home five with girls, same outlet. Same structure. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> How'd you like your roommate? Oh, man. Uh, you had several of them until you meet some and then they let you change. Well, I was in, uh, back then I only weighed probably about 115 pounds. And uh, I, I was in it with some Cheyennes, five of them, you know. So every day, you know, I'd go in there and they speak Cheyenne. And they would say this name every time I'd come in and they'd look, you know. So one day I, I said, look, I said, uh, can you tell me what you're doing? I said, I know you're calling me a name. And I said, uh, he goes, Husky, you're Husky. So that was my name. <laughs> was Husky. They were teasing you. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, well, you know, but you didn't, didn't you find, and you ended up with, uh, you know, them, because they came back, you know, <clears throat> most of them did. What were some of the classes that you enjoyed? The class, every one of them. Yeah, one I didn't enjoy. I mean, uh, it's like I said, it was a new life. It was, and uh, and I, half day was in school, and the other half was vocational, trade. right? Yeah. What trade? What path did you investigate? Printing, printing. Uh, uh, I like to, uh, I guess you call it create. You know. Mm -hmm. So in there, of course, they. Uh, outside work come in. Back then they had these ham radio things and they would bring in uh, pictures and stuff and of course it wasn't any good. So then I'd redo it, you know, with my artwork talent and I'd do that. And, and uh, as a uh, junior, you're not supposed to go into this one room because that's for seniors. Well, I met this guy who was post-grad and I told him, I said, look, I'm gonna do this for life. I think I really like it. And he goes, you're not supposed to be in here. He goes, but the instructor's busy and I'll show you what to do. Well, he got a job in Arkan City or somewhere. So they had to have somebody run a machine and a camera. And I said, I know how. So I got to go in there and that's what I done. Was I printed the uh, uh, annuals. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they entered some of my stuff in Oklahoma City and I, earned, I won some awards on my printing. Uh, because part of it was like graphic, you were actually doing some drawing, some original right. drawing mm -hmm. yeah. the, as part of the printing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were bringing stuff in and, and they weren't artists, you know. Right. And how to redo them. Well, how early did you start drawing? Probably since I could walk. Mm -hmm. I've got some stuff that my brother found in my aunt's garage that I'd done in the third grade. It was painting on glass. There was four pictures. And he found them for me and gave them back to me, or gave them to me, put it that way. And in the public schools, even though you had a rough time with the kids, but did any of the teachers notice your abilities? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, there was one. Uh, I done uh, murals on, they had chalkboards, like three walls or so. And I think I was in probably the third or fourth grade. Well, I took colored chalk, and when it was Christmas, I done Santa Claus in a sleigh and a reindeer, you know. And then uh, when it was uh, Thanksgiving, I'd done turkeys and stuff like that. Put them in chalk, you know. Stuff like that, and then uh, I went on. Uh, I mean, never had art license. To this day, I've never had art mm -hmm. uh, But uh, they kind of pushed me toward it. Mm -hmm. And what really got me thinking somebody really cared about you, uh, when I was in uh, junior high, I was around the kids who could care less about living or doing anything. They were, when I looked back, I thought, man, I'm glad I got away from them. Mm -hmm. But this uh, teacher, she took me aside. She goes, I'm going to put you in another class because I think you got, you got some ability that, you know. So she put me in a class with the honor roll. Oh, wow. I'm making an S, see. <laughs> Didn't care about anything. She put me right there in front of her desk. And I come out with C average that quarter. So he said, see, I told you. And so <laughs> she that, recognized your talent. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened here. Just, you know, I, I, I roomed with guys that were in honor roll and stuff like that. And I wasn't going to sit there and be an <laughs> SD. But they helped me, really. I mean, I told this guy uh, not too long ago, roomed with me. He was on honor roll. 
And now he lives in Hawaii. I said, I said, one thing you've done for me, I said, was show me that I could actually use my mind. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, I never knew that. And I go, yeah. I said, you, you had some thing up in your brain. You helped me with my schoolwork to figure it out. Right. And I said, I thank you for that. So. That's neat. Well, um, and you mentioned you loved sports, especially baseball. So at Chilaco, you got the opportunity to do some sports. Uh, yeah, I played it. Uh, I came in as a sophomore. Went out. My brother was here too. He was a pitcher. And now he was his younger brother. He was uh, older than me, but he okay. was a. He had to make up because he like me. He quit school, you know, and make up. Mm -hmm. But he he soon was with me. But uh, anyway, when I came here, uh, they had a junior playing short or second base. I went out to second base, that's all I've ever played. And uh, of course he hadn't been here before so they chose him. And uh, that's my good way of saying I got beat out. But uh, I'm sitting on the bench, we're playing Ponk City. So I'm sitting on the bench and the co uh, you know, this guy gets up there and we got needing runs, he struck out. He got up there again and he struck out. And I'm sitting there kicking dirt and I hear the Coach say, oh, Coach Moore, he goes, no, you know, like that. And I go, uh-oh. I go, why? He goes, get your helmet on. And I go, my heart starts going, because I know what I'm going to do. He goes, get your bat. And he, get, and he told that other guy, he goes, you go set the bench. And I'm thinking, this guy's going to beat me up after this. <laughs> so anyway, I go, I got my stuff, and he goes, look, we need runs. He goes, can you hit the ball? I go, sure. He goes, will you hit the ball? I go, I sure will. He goes, and get up there and do it. So I knocked in a run, and I never set the bench after that. Oh, that's great. And uh, I never struck out in my three years. Now, I haven't proofed on this, but the guys told me that I made all conference at second base. I don't have any proof on it. Uh, I, thought I'd, I thought I'd make, because I never struck out, and I had a good batting average. I had my senior year a good, you know, good average junior. And they told me that, and they go, you know you made all commerce. I go, well, I don't know, because I graduated in May 18th, I think it was. And I went to my rooms and took my clothes to the dorm, uh, to uh, armory. The next morning, we left on the bus. So when I handed out those things, I wasn't there. And I, it was like 20 years before I came back. Oh, my goodness. So I don't know, and they told me I did, so mm -hmm. I said, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, but before you left Chilaco, you had decided to join the National Guard. Uh, yeah, I was 16. Mm -hmm. And what were the reasons for enlisting? Well, I really didn't know what it was. Uh, my friends, there's four of them, were, they uh, go, James, why don't, why don't I go down here and join the Guards unit? I go, what is it? And they go, well, it's a military thing. He goes, it's kind of like going to ROTC. I said, well, I don't know what that is. And uh, they go, y you know, you get, you train for the military. I said, okay. And uh, I'm 16 years old. I'm going with them, see. I don't know what I'm doing, really. And so we go, and he goes, by the way, you got to lie about your age. And I go, why? You got to be 17. I go, okay. So we go in there and got left the papers. We're all 17. Mm -hmm. And so we step back, we take the oath, we get all the uniforms and everything, and of course they pay you. And uh, well, about two months, they come back and call me in. They go, You're not 17. Oh, yeah, I am. They go, Oh, we sent papers to your parents and they won't sign them because they said you're not 17. <sighs> Rats. <You> go, <laughs> I go, what do I do now? Turn your stuff in. I go, okay. So I did. He goes, when you turn 17, come back. So a couple months later, I turned 17, I went back. And then... Uh, did you go on back to school then? Yeah, I was in in still in school. Yeah, because yeah, uh, you yeah. were in the National I, Yeah, Guard. I spent three, three years here. Yeah. But then, like I say, we graduated, and, and we was on a bus to be training. And that's another story. <laughs> oh, I'd like to hear it if you don't mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, there's 22 of us, so we get on the bus and, and we go to Fort Polk, Louisiana, and when we get there, they put us in a certain room, which I thought was, you know, what they always done. <clears throat> and this uh, sergeant comes in, and he goes, uh, uh, the, everybody's been waiting on you guys to get here. 
and we're thinking, what? And I go, why? And they go, well, they're all Easterners, lawyers and doctors and all that stuff. They've never seen an Indian. They think you guys ride a horse and got teepees and war paint, and bows and arrows. And uh, uh, we all had hair slicked back. We were greasers, they call them, slicked back yeah. duck tails. Yeah. So when we go in there, of course, first thing they do is give you a haircut. They go, how do you want it? And I saw it off the side, and they go, eh, you can come out like an onion. <laughs> but anyway, we're, uh, he says, uh, what we want to know is, are you guys prejudiced? And we kind of like laughed around, you know, we've heard that before. But anyway, they got all these photographers there from the newspaper, and they're taking our picture and interviewing us because- Because it was such a big contingent from uh -huh. And uh, so they go, we're going to go take you to your dorm and uh, meet your sergeant, okay? And they go, by the way, He's black, and we'd never seen a black person, so we didn't know, because and basically that's what they called us, see, that's one time, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, we go in there, you know, and here's all the guys, and we walk down the hallway, and they're looking at us, you know, and the first Indians they ever seen us, they're talking, you know. So we go in the sergeant's room, sit down, no chairs, so we sit down, cross our legs. He goes, boy, you guys are Indians, ain't you? even sit like Indians. And he goes, we're going to bring your sergeant in. So he comes in, and of course he is a little bit darker than us, and we all look, kind of like when they looked at us, because we never, it's the first time I ever was there. And he said, we're going to divide each other up. He goes, now these guys have never seen any Indians, so you want to watch yourself. So when they take us to our bar uh, barracks, uh, they switch us up bottom floor, top floor, and your bunks. So we go over there on our bunks and we're sitting there and of course they send that one over, you know, that hey, get over there, you know. So mm -hmm. they come over there and they go, hi. And we don't say anything. We know they're coming over there, so we don't say anything. And they go, you speak English? Don't say anything to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you just talk Indian? You got any horses? Buffaloes and all that. Just went for the whole mm -hmm, spiel, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not that they weren't ignorant, they just didn't know. And uh, they go, Well, you sure you can't speak English? And we go, No, we don't speak English. He, he goes, <laughs> You do speak, where did you learn to speak English? I said, We went to a boarding school for Indians, they taught us good English. Live in a white man world, they said. So here we are. I said, and, uh, I said one thing about it, you guys got the same clothes we do, they're all green. <laughs> but, but that that basically what happened there and, and of course then you bond together mm. and you're all one, mm. watch each other's back and so forth. Mm. And then whenever I got out of basic, they, in Louisiana they sent us to Fort Lord, California to fish or uh, some of our training right there on the beach of Monterey Peninsula. Um, had you been to Louisiana before? No. So what were you got a chance to go off base once in a while? Oh yeah. What were your impressions? <laughs> it was big old tall trees and and uh, all he had. Uh, if you had the military, they knew you was military. They knew you had money, <laughs> and you going to spend it because mm -hmm. every first of the month you got paid. See, and boy, they just I didn't. I just went up there to see what it was about, mm -hmm. and that's about it. Because you know, you're where I come from in Miami. You know, there wasn't no, nothing like what was up there. Right. And uh, and California, same way. That right. You've never been. Oh, I, I probably should say this on tape, but uh, you know, you read about these people that walk the streets. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, so we got to got a cab and we told him says we want to go on I think it was Market Street or something we were on he goes no you don't want to go there and they go yeah we do we heard about it in a book he goes all right but I'm not stopping so he takes us down there and we see what we want to see and you go yeah go on <laughs> but you know you you you're people I mean we already saw TV here I mean there's one here newspapers 
you know, something like that. And when Kennedy got killed, we got to see the TV quite a bit. Oh, that's right. You were. What was that like? That moment when you found out? Shocking. Mm -hmm. I mean, who, who everybody liked to John, you? you know, mm -hmm. John Kennedy. But we'd gone to our uh, uh, printing class, and we were there five minutes. And I go, you need to go back to your dormitory. We didn't know why, mm -hmm. so everybody went to their dormitories. And of course, we our guidance counselor, uh, we had there in the floor there. And, Chairs and he told us says uh, President Kennedy's been assassinated, and mm -hmm. of course we're shot. And uh, so they go, they caught the guy who done it, and so that and they said they was going to take him Sunday, I believe it was, to escort him somewhere. So the guys, we're sitting down there, and they go, James, you going down? And I go, no. Why? I said, well, I don't know, I had this thing, and it said, somebody's going to kill him. Oh, and you that, had an idea, you had that, you saw that. Uh -huh. and, and I said, they're going to kill him, and we're never going to know the truth. And I said, I'm not going down there. So they come running upstairs, and they go, James, they shot him. They killed him. Wow. And I said, I told them. And, uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, I say we, it was, it was a shocking moment there. I say, uh, and I never did believe he'd done it, mm -hmm. uh, Oswald, mm -hmm. because of, you know, the military type thing, I knew he could shoot a rifle. He was in the Marine Corps and any military, the first thing they do is train you with a rifle. Mm -hmm. So years later, they opened up that bookstore. So I was one of the first ones to go through it. I went up there and they And this floor. is in Dallas? Yeah, in Dallas. You were walking through? Yeah. And so they had it, glass, where it was at, had a glass around it, but mm -hmm. all the windows were the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there looking at it, and I see this sign up here in the stoplights and a tree. And, I was, and I'm looking this way, and I'm talking to myself, why didn't you shoot him here your best shot? And I'm thinking, you couldn't make a getaway if you didn't. Because you're trained to shoot that rifle, first shot kill, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I act like I was shooting a rifle like that, and I go, bang, bang. I said, he got him, he can, he done it. I said, he done it, it's easy. I mean, it's just right here. Mm -hmm. And this guy taps me on the shoulder, and he goes, now what did you say? And I turn around, and the guy had a, nameplate or something on it. He goes, what did you just say? I said, oh, I was just talking to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm dying getting out of here. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that convinced me that all is well done. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know. Having seen that room for mm -hmm. yourself. What did you get your specialized training in, in the uh, military? What was it? Infantry. Infantry. Infantry okay. rifleman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They teach you everything. Mm -hmm. uh, how to use bayonet and uh, karate. Mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't go to Vietnam. No, we just, uh, uh, we were, as I say, trained to go, but they didn't call us. They, they gave us the alert, mm -hmm. so they trained us hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you see today, the only place thing over there are reserves. Those reserves, not they have got, that's because they don't have a draft anymore. Right. And anymore, I was telling the wife, I said, you know, anymore, I wouldn't make it in the Army because of the sophistication of the weapons. I said, you got to have a college education, pull trigger. I said, those things can hit a net or yard Very away. complicated. Uh, yeah. And I said, and they can wipe out anything. And uh, I said, but uh, I said, I didn't. my brother went to Vietnam, come back. Mm -hmm. There's five brothers, we all served Navy and the Army and Marine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you meet your wife at Chilaco? No, okay. I met her uh, where I was working at. So, so after you served in the service, when you left the service, then what happened? Uh, of course, I went back to, they transferred, transferred me to a unit, mm -hmm. and uh, my brother was getting ready to go to Vietnam, and I only had about 
few more months left. And uh, like I said, it wasn't good at the time for me, for me. So we were sitting there and I told him, I said, you know what? I'm just going to re-enlist in the regular army. He goes, why? And I said, I just want to. He goes, you can't. I go, why? He was the older brother, you know. And then when you're in an in Indian family, the older one is the one that, mm -hmm. he goes, because of this, I'm going to Vietnam. Your brother's in the army. You got two young boys. You got four sisters. There's, where's mom and dad? We don't know. Who's going to raise them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he goes, you're going to take care of them. I said, okay. So I did. <laughs> they turned out pretty good. One of them was a doctor, and the other one was uh, worked for the sheriff department and security guard at the uh, college for 20 years. Oh, wow. And it turned out real good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you were kind of at home with the kids yes, after? Yes, uh, after that. After I, had, I mean, until they got on their own, you know. Right, right. I mean, they were young. When I, and I really, It's I, a big I, responsibility. I know it. Tell me. I had to have a house, a home for them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, get a job and... Were uh, you able to find a printing job? No. Or, okay. Uh, I didn't find one. Because you were uh, back in Miami. Yeah, and uh, they, they had shop, but they didn't have any openings. Mm -hmm. So I went to work for a meal, uh, a feed meal thing. Worked there and finally something came up. And I'm still working at that same place. Is that right? Oh my goodness. 20 something years. Now, right. I did move to Tulsa and work up there to it's a great big old plant, 24-hour plant. I worked there, but then my kids got older and graduated, started graduating, and I said, "Well, I'm getting, I'm going back home." <laughs> so I went back home. Well, um, tell us just a little bit about your artwork too, because that's been a big thread of your life that you've kept mm -hmm. going um, uh, since you were Well, like I say, uh, I've done it, and uh, there's this uh, artist in town. His name is Charles Banks Wilson. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does uh, Native American work, uh, just about anything. Portraits, I mean, he was, he was I never seen anybody like him. And I grew up knowing him. And uh, of course, everybody did in that town. And I had a whole slew of paintings, uh, not paintings, but drawings. So one day I called him and I said, Charles? And he goes, yeah. Uh, I said, I have a drawing here I'd like for you to look at. He said, okay. And uh, I said, so my dad, he was all right, bring it on up. So I took it up to his studio and I said, Charles, uh, since we know each other, I want you to critique these. And when I put it here, I don't want you to say, oh, that's good, James. You know? I said, I want you I want to critique it for me because I want to draw uh, real people. Mm -hmm. He goes, okay. So I set it down there and he looked at it and he goes, how'd you do this and how'd you do that? And I told him. He goes, well, that's your dad, because it looks like him. He says, uh, I said, Dad, you kind of rounded his jaw. I said, he got his head kind of, you know, we just talked about stuff like that. And he goes, yeah, you done a good job on it. And I said, well, uh, so what do you think? He goes, well, just keep on drawing. He told me what to do, you know, like get shirts and put them on the side and stretch them to learn how to do the wrinkles. And he goes, draw what you see. Draw what, you, what your eyes tell you and then it'll come out here. And I said, okay. And he goes, first of all, I'm gonna tell you something. You're in it. What you're gonna do is one that nobody really wants to do because the critics are gonna be out there, especially your family. Don't ever ask them, they're the worst critics. They'll go, well, that don't look like them or something like that, and here you are, you know. And so that's what I've done. I just started, I never, I started entering art contests, started winning, and uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't do it for the win. I just wanted my work out there because I mean, I, I get paid for it. And right. then I started on my Native American stuff, and they would always bring that to me, and and that's basically how I do all this stuff. I find it, and and uh, Wes there, I, I really liked him character he's played. And, yes, he showed me a really nice drawing and, uh, from so, Last of the Mohicans, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, yeah, I've done, I don't know how many drawings. Uh, You've had commissions. Tell us oh, about yeah. your Heisman. Oh, my Heisman stuff was from uh, Jason White. Uh, I've done uh, Billy Sims, Steve Owens, uh, Billy Vessels. Uh, right now, the other two I haven't got permission. I drew the picture, but i got to get mm -hmm. 
what I do, I give them a, a, a picture. That's see, so nice. and then they, yeah. in turn, they'll sign something. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, yeah, I've done all that, and I worked with a guy that done nothing but OU posters, and he done uh, my name was Ted Watts. He's really in Oklahoma, but he done all sports. And we got together one day, and uh, he needed some stuff, and I had it. And he goes, "Why don't you loan me that?" And I go, "No." And he goes, "Why not?" And I said, "Well, that's stuff I've collected." I said, "He goes, what do you want in trade for that?" I said, "I don't know how to paint." He goes, "What?" I don't know how to paint. I said, "I can draw, but I can't paint." So what he done? I loaned him my stuff for a year. And he'd call me up, and I'd, I'd go to his studio. He locked the door, and he'd start painting, telling me what to do is. It took me five years just to get something good. Well, that's pretty quick, so actually, we, I'd say, yeah, for we, an apprenticeship. And uh, she. So you paint now, too? Oh, yeah, I mm -hmm. paint. And then uh, uh, my. Uh, I'd say one of the things that happened in our family, I talk about it a lot, was when they. Charles Banks Wilson was doing the uh, pictures for the state capitol. Mm -hmm. He done uh, Sequoia and uh, you know those uh, Jim Thorpe. Mm -hmm. He asked me to do Jim Thorpe, but I knew he wasn't going to use me. He was going to use body pieces. He does that. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing, but uh, I turned that down. And so he asked my dad to post for, for Sequoia. Mm -hmm. So my dad did. So it's hanging in the state capitol. Wow. And uh, it's cool. about, what, eight or nine foot tall. Yes. It, just the face now. Because the turban every Cherokee wore, mm -hmm. the robe he's got on is in the uh, historical side in a case. And of course he had Cherokee box. All that was. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he, he uh, done several of them, pictures of him, and uh, he gave them to me. Because my dad passed away. See? Mm -hmm. And uh, so he gave me those pictures. And uh, which I still got because he passed away. And then he asked me the, uh, to pose for him in the murals. He done those four murals in the state capitol. And I done those and uh, I posed for the Cherokees and Creeks and several others. And mm -hmm. uh, he sent me the negatives and the uh, pictures that I posed for him because when my kids would take him to school for show and tell, they'd call them liars. You know, that, ain't, that ain't here. So I told him, I said, I get tired of them calling my kids liars. He goes, we'll fix that. So on, he said, bring them pictures back. So I took them back. He wrote on there that my dad's name was Joe. Mm -hmm. He goes, Joe and I will pose for Sequoia's face. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, it's Joe Noel's face, son's hair. Like that. <laughs> and he dated, you know, he got those pictures out and he got Sunday's pictures, stuff that for my kids, and, mm -hmm. but but I'm hanging in state capitol. I was telling him out there, I said, I'm representing Shalako. I'm up there now. How many of you guys <laughs> are up right, there? That's right. How the many you guys capital. are up there? That's a great story. But, and an, another one was, uh, it's not about art, but uh, uh, it's about a young man. I call him young man. He's the same age as me. He passed away. His name is Jim Squirrel Jr. Out of uh, Stillwell, Oklahoma. He was one of them that went, we went to basic again, and then we went to, let's say, AIT in California. Well, we had this thing, what they call escape and evasion. They take you out there at nighttime, and you got to make your way back to this place, and there's people waiting on you. Well, there was four of us, and you got caught. They uh, stripped you. Uh, made you eat this old oatmeal, had this old, they had salt and stuff in it, and they put you in a box, might put, you, put throw a snake or something in there with you, mm -hmm. and you were in there for a long time. And then, but anyway, we made it back. These, these guys, they Without started running. Without being caught. Yeah, and I told them, I said, wait a minute, guys, L look at them. These guys out there smoking cigarettes, you can hear their voice. I said, when they go that way, we're going this way. Mm -hmm. And so I took them through. And we made it. What we done, we got there and there's guards out there and they was going back and forth like this. I said, well, it's time them. And I said, well, all we got to do is get across that deal and we're safe. And I said, so take your boots off. 
They go, why? I said, you can run faster without them. Throw them on your shoulder, and I, when I say go, we go. Every man for himself. And we, all of us made it. You kind of let them in. <laughs> yeah. And so we go in this big old amphitheater. It's got a one-way, uh, two-way mirror thing, or what do you call it. We're all sitting there, and they, they talk about, you know, what they've done, who they caught, and they go, and they brought them in there, and they put them in a chair and tied their hands together and put electrodes on them all here, you know. And they'd ask them a question, and if they didn't answer, they turned on, they go, oh, like that, you know, and we're sitting there looking. So anyway, they brought this uh, Navajo guy in, his name's Thomas, I can't remember, and they go, hey, there's Thomas. He, he passed out when they put a nail in him, I mean, not a nail, but when they shot him for medicine, he passed out, and we had to hold him up. And I said, okay. <laughs> anyway, all the others, they broke down. All the others did. I mean, they broke down, crying, telling everything. And that's when they would tell us, see, we got ways. So they'd bring this one in. Here come on Thomas, and we go, Thomas. So we're all sitting there on edgy. Anyway, Thomas didn't say a thing. He didn't tell them nothing, you know. He just took, took him shocks, and they took them out, and we looked at each other and go, dang. <laughs> Me and the shocks done him like that needle, but he, true to Thing. He didn't say nothing. He didn't break and they, him. they go, well, we didn't break him. So they and they got one more. They were Jim Squirrel. And Jim Squirrel was, I'm not going to say typical because that don't sound right, but he was quiet. He would listen to you. He'd look up like that. And, and if uh, you wanted to do roughness, he'd be rough with you. But he was just that way. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get nothing out of him unless he wanted to tell you. And we go, they're bringing in squirrel, like that. And guys go, you know. And so we're all sitting back, and they put squirrel down in there. And he said, hey, I already busted his lips. And uh, he was on that thing. They put that stuff on him. They asked him, they go, you're Indian, aren't you? He goes, Cause he, like, I don't know what happened, but he's just like this, you know. He shook his head. And you know, your name's Squirrel. He goes, are, are you a squirrely squirrel? He shook his head. He goes, by the way, there's a bunch of Indians in your unit. You know that, don't you? He goes, they don't like you. He didn't say nothing. Your old head went. Because he, he knows they was, mm -hmm. what's going on. And uh, he goes, you know they don't like you? He goes, well, we'll get through with that. He goes, uh, where do you live? They sit there and they go, mm -hmm. they go, what's your mom's name? Mm -hmm. So, what's your dad's name? They just go through the whole field, those squirrels, mm -hmm. and they was putting the juice to him because his little finger just went wow. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they go, what rank are you? And uh, he goes, when well, that's your last time, where do you live and where do you come from? He looks up and he goes, okay. So we're looking. So they hand him a piece of paper about half this size and a pencil. And they loosen his arm. And old squirrel, he's writing, you know, on that like that. And he folded it up and handed it to this guy. And we're all sitting there. They take him out. They turn the lights on and this sergeant gets in front of us. He goes, see, we break them all. And if they don't do it, they eventually do. This guy thought he was going to do it, and he didn't. He goes, Sergeant, hand me that paper. He goes, but, but Sarge, he goes, hand me the paper. He goes, okay. So he goes, here's what, where he lives and what he said. And we're all sitting there. And I can't say it on tape, but I'll, he goes, F you. <laughs> he played it, he pranked him good. <laughs> And they, they, you know, anyway, they awarded him certificates. And the last four weeks, all he did was sit in bed and go to the theaters. Oh. Didn't have to do. Been what, through that. Because he interrogation. Yeah. Yeah. And and he did he, he didn't uh, do nothing. So I mean that that's something else. So. Yeah. Well, why are the Shalako reunions important to you? Oh, you're, you're uh, well, they're like brothers and sisters. 
to us they are. Uh, it don't matter how old they are or what, they got to, this is home. And uh, you come back. That's it. How about um, your activities with veterans groups and, and any native veterans groups? Or any? Oh, don't, uh, uh, just uh, powwows and stuff like that, and like mm -hmm. they have, they have uh, the veteran dances and stuff like that, and they have mm -hmm. a breakfast here. Mm -hmm. And all your tribes, uh, uh, where I go, uh, is you're something. I mean, mm -hmm. We're nothing, really, but mm -hmm. they, they treat you, you know. They, uh, uh, call you out there and give you gifts mm -hmm. and while you're dancing and stuff like that. And they gave us uh, medals and stuff like that. And then the Cherokee Nation, which uh, I'm enrolled in, mm -hmm. each month they uh, have veterans come up there, you know, and they read a thing, give you a, a medal and a ribbon and a certificate for serving in the military, you know. And my three brothers and me got to go up there to that. They gave us a uh, thing and out here they do the same thing and, and uh, stuff like that and they, I don't know if you've seen our jackets they gave it I got my neat. see I wore this one today because this is a Seminole veterans oh neat. see yeah, yeah because of Mitch and then tomorrow I'll wear the Shilako watch oh neat see? yes and uh, that they gave to us so mm -hmm. but uh, yeah I, I really like it it's a uh, I mean, to get out there and, and uh, like I say, it don't, it don't matter who. It's just home. That's all there is to it. It's, it's, uh, uh, and they'll tell you, every one of them out there will tell you, this is home. Mm -hmm. Even though when you go back uh, to the other home, well, to come back here to see all this, we all knew what went on here mm -hmm. and everything, but the good and the bad. And, uh, I had an interview from a lady from New York. She was writing a book, and I don't know how she got a hold of me, but she came to the door and told me who she was. I'm right. She showed me all her stuff, and I go, okay, and she, she done this same thing. Mm -hmm. And she opened up with, I heard you guys got beat. And he said, uh, I said, is this what we're going to talk about? And she goes, well, it's part of the what happened in that boarding school. I said, I worked there for three years. I said, I didn't see anybody get beat. I didn't see get anybody get mistreated. I said, we had respect for ourselves. And, and it's like I say, is that uh, when we left, you know, we're representing Shalako out there. We're mm -hmm. representing the Indian people. Mm -hmm. And I said, Shalako done a lot for us, so now we're turning in turn doing for Shalako. Because, I mean, everything I do, you know, uh, you came to Shalaka. Well, you know, it's kind of like this. What did you do? And we told them, you know, education, that's all we got. Right. And, uh, but it's just, uh, it, it's, it's a different story. I mean, uh, when I brought my wife up here the first time, uh, she looked, you know, and she goes, this is where you lived? And I go, yeah. I said, I lived in those dormitories over there, and women lived over there. And I said, we socialized around the Oval and stuff like that, and they had these whistles. They would stand on one place like that. You got too close, they'd blow that whistle. Then they had these flashlights when it kind of got dark. I said, man, I still hear that whistle. <laughs> like that. And so, anyway, I said, and, you know, so, uh, you went to all social events. You had, to, they had a, a dance thing you could go to. You know, they had activities, you know, for you here. All kinds of things, even for the different groups. You know, they had the groups, uh, when they brought the Navajos in, you know, they weren't too, their, their language, they didn't know the English name. They knew the old ways, which is good. I like it. And uh, I try to teach that to my kids, the old ways and stuff like that, that I know, that I was taught. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm, you know, I just sit and listen to them talk. You know, it's amazing. I mean, when you, you know, different languages and stuff like that. And, uh, but uh, they were young. Some of them were just real young kids come here and went all the way through it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you were welcoming to them. Oh yeah, I like uh, you know even the ones that were my age and so forth, mm -hmm. and they would you know they taught me some of the words you know which uh, you know, and we call each other old Navajo, yo Navajo, <laughs> or and they go yo Cherokee, you know, but but it's in good spirit, you know, mm -hmm. 
get spared. And, I mean, it's, it's uh, like I say, even uh, it's, uh, that everybody, well, most guys out here, they'll go, when we got in basic, we already knew how to fix a bed the way they done it. We knew how to sweep the floor, mop it. We knew everything. They teach us anything. We taught them. And I said, yeah, you know what? Everybody needs to go through a school like this. I said, you're de you, you, you learn to be dependent. You don't, you know, there's no mom and dad. The only ones, mom and dad, was those guys that stayed there at night time. And uh, I said, you made your own decision. And if it was the uh, wrong one, then you paid for it. And, and you hope it was the right one. And you learn that, you know, education is going to be what's going to keep you going. And uh, I said, that's what I learned. Anyway, if you learned anything, you learned that. It ain't going to happen without education. So you better buckle down. And that's what I've done. And uh, that's what I tell my kids, too. I said, you know, it, the, the world's changing real quick. I said, so you better get in there and bust your head and get it done. I said, I said one thing, I said, everybody's going to look at you and you don't realize what they're, they're, they're wanting you to fail. They're looking for you to fail. And uh, I said, that's my one thing. I, I knew that and I didn't want to fail. And I started trying hard as I could. And uh, this is where it all happened right here. That's why we come back. That's why we come back. Uh, I, did I tell you whenever we, everybody gets this and that, but when we were sitting there, it was night time, about 11 o'clock, bed, bed check was at 10. Or 10 30 and lights were out at 10 30 i think so we're laying there in bed and everybody talks you know and this one guy goes uh i'm hungry i said i am too and the other guy says yeah it's just it's a long ways till the morning he goes i like to have a hamburger i said me too we're gonna get one state line i go god and like i said it kind of rained that day and so we look at each other and well, let's go. Anybody get any money? This guy goes, I got some. Okay. I said, we're all broke. So anyway, we were in a home six on the second floor. So we gone down the back way, out the stairs, went out the back, went down by the uh, armory behind it, waiting on cars to come by, because every once in a while one come by. So then we went across the wheat fields and there was a state line there and, and there was a, well, it was a gas station with a restaurant type thing, you know, you could eat in there and everything, we knew it. So we go in there and they go, you guys from the school? Yeah. Do they know you're out? No. I says, oh. But we're hungry. And he goes, well, what do you want? You got money? Yeah. And uh, we want hamburgers and fries and a pop. He goes, a pop? Yeah, you know, so pop. He goes, oh, okay. So he fried up some hamburgers and fries and got them on the counter and all of a sudden he goes, he goes, your, your man here is from school. Oh, so we ran around there and hid behind the counter. So a guy walks in, he goes, you see any of, them our, any of our students out here anywhere today? He goes, no, not, I haven't seen any. He goes, what's all this food? He says, oh, those truck drivers, they called in, we get it ready for them, they'll be in a minute. So we're down there listening. He goes, all right, so he takes off, you know. And when he does, we take out the back and don't pay for our food, it's still sitting there. And we go run across the street there, uh, street, the uh, gravel road there in them wheat fields and it's muddy. And we're to land down there because here's that pickup truck with old Crossco, we call him Hook because he had a hook. And he's got these great big old spotlight, him, a couple of guys. And I mean, they were spotlights. That's going through them. We're laying down like this. So when they went to the way, they go, What are we going to do? I said, I don't know, but I think we're going to go to jail. I said, we can pay for that food. And so we're sitting there and we didn't know what to do because in spotlights, I said, He's looking for us, really. And so I told him, I said, hey guys, 
we're going to have to kill the fatted cow or lamb, excuse me, lamb. And they go, what do you mean? I said, this guy's named James Hobucket. And uh, he didn't do anything wrong. You know, to them, they did. He just follow her, you know. And we go, Hobucket, you're going back. He goes, I ain't going back. I said, yeah, you are, because they know you won't do anything, and we've been in trouble before, and they're going to get us. He goes, and now everybody else says, you're going back, Hobucket. Here's the money. Because if you don't pay them, we're going to go to jail. And they'll ask you questions, and don't you tell them our names or nothing. He goes, okay. So he gets up, and he raises his hands. I said, put your hands down. <laughs> what, what do you think you do? Policeman standing there getting, going to search you. I said, get your hands down. And I said, go that way so they'll go with you, and we can take off. So he goes out that way, and, of course, you hear him grabbing him, and, and uh, we take off toward the dormitory. We had to go back the same way because, you know, I was afraid to get caught. We go back upstairs, jump into bed. Whole bucket ain't there. I go, where's whole bucket? I don't know. So we pull the sheets over us, and we're laying there with all our shoes on, dirty clothes, mud everywhere. We don't know that because the lights are out, see. And pretty soon the light comes on. Old cross goes, he goes, all right, boys, get up. Go, what? You know, I'm sleeping. He goes, you ain't sleeping. Get up. So we got up, pulled in, and I go, wow, we got mud all over, look at them sheets. And, and the tracks were coming down the hall where we, it's like laying out a piece of bread, here it is, come get it. And so he goes, you boys thought you'd get away with it, didn't you? So we had to go to the office, and they gave us the one, two, three, and they go, your punishment is 40 hours. You got 40 hours each. We're going to start with the latrine, they call it latrine, you know. We're going to start with that. You're going to scrub the floors with a brush. Then you're going to take and put polish on them with a rag. And then we're going to start on the stairways until all 40 hours. So we got them worked off. And I came back and I graduated in 1965 and I brought my family up here in 1980 and the lady she just passed away was a matron there on nights sometimes they trade off and on mm -hmm. anyways I walked into the uh, office there to get me a pass so I could be on campus and eat and so I walked in there and she turned around she looked and she goes James no what are you doing back here she goes I know she got that clipboard she goes you owe me 30 hours like that, and I go, what? She goes, yeah, it's right here. You owe me 30 hours. I go, I'll work my hours off. She just started laughing, you know. Oh, well, that, I think that's a great story to end on. I'm so glad you shared that with us. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, James. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun.